Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Thank you for the song offered by our friends. It is indeed uh, nice when it doesn't rain. But if it rains too much, it is also not nice. So weather like this is beautiful. It's beautiful. We have uh, spent the last week covering many topics that deals with our identity in Christ. In the first day, we talked about our identity, which is very important. And then we liken our travel on this earth just like traveling on an airplane, which requires your identity to always be shown in all aspects of the journey until you arrive to your final destination. And in our case, our final destination is heaven. And then we also talked about how we should invite Jesus to live in our hearts, to help us change, to become a new person. To let Jesus live in our hearts. And then we also talked about how we have to give the best of ourselves in all aspects of our lives because Jesus also gave the best for each one of us. We also talked about how we should exert a Christ-like appearance in our daily lives. We take care of our bodies and then we offer it as a living sacrifice by showing it clean, taken care of, following the principles of the Bible. And we also see the example of Jesus who has dealt with temptation and was victorious over it. And therefore, we are also called to do the same so that we may be tried and true. And then we have also learned how, that, how we could be a good friend, how we could have a social relationship with others that will uplift Christ. And then finally, we learned about how we should always develop an attitude of gratitude in our lives. Because God longs for us to do so. Last night, we talked about Calvary, the ultimate sacrifice. And today, we're going to talk about Christ dwelling supreme in my life. The text that was read just now was found in John 12, 32. It says, And, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And I have an, included also a passage, uh, quotation from Mrs. White. This day with God, page 314. The closing work of the third angel's message will be attended with a power that will send the rays of the sun of righteousness into all the highways and byways of life. And decisions will be made for God as supreme governor. His law will be looked upon as the rule of his government. In order for us to have Christ dwelling supreme in my, in my life, in our lives, we need to have a relationship with him. That, according to this passage, with a good relationship with him, Christ will be lifted up. And for us, will be a channel of blessing for others to come into a relationship with God also. And so the key word here is attraction. If we want to be lifted up, if we want to lift up Christ in our daily life so others may also be attracted to Him, 
so that others also may have Christ living in their lives. The key word here is attraction. The law of attraction, according to Wikipedia, in the history of science, the law of attraction are a set of assumed laws or in a sense a general catchphrase used when discussing the nature of bodies that attract. In the mid-20th century, social scientists began to apply Plato's first law of affinity that similar, similar attracts to relationship life, noting that, for example, people tend to marry based on such factors of age, religion, socioeconomic status, and education. And in the 1950s, in opposition to this view, sociologist Robert Winch proposed that opposites attract theory. He argues that people are attracted to those whose needs conversely match his or hers, her own. Similarly, the relationship of God and humankind is like the attraction theory. God is attracted to us, and we are also attracted to God. The only difference is that God is not attracted to us because He needs us, but because He loves us. And on the other side of the coin, we are attracted to Him because we need Him. And so it is important for us to understand what kind of attraction should we be developing in our lives in order for us to be living with His will in our lives. Attraction is a very powerful thing. We can see examples in our lives in various, various analogies. But this morning, I want to show you the example of how one is attracted to a number, number four. This man is attracted to number four. German Emperor Charles the Fourth. He is so attracted to his name, the Fourth, that all aspects of his life he makes it important that there is a number four. You see, he ate, he ate four four meals daily. He lived in four palaces of four rooms in each. Each room had four doors, four tables, and chandeliers. His crown had four branches. His dress, four colors. He spoke four languages, was married four times. Maybe he did it on purpose. The imperial coach was drawn by four horses instead of two. His meals consisted of four courses with four kinds of wine. He divided his empire into four parts and his army into four corps. He created four dukes, four margraves, four generals, and four captains. He resided in four capitals, presided over four grand marshals. And look at this, the interesting part is, there were four doctors, at his bedside when he died at four minutes past four in 1378. It's good he didn't die in 1874. But you see, my dear friends, the laws of attraction is really manifested in this Duke. He really wants everything in his life to be associated with number four because he is the fourth in his line of descendant. It is quite obsessive. It is quite an obsession, actually, with what this man is. Yet, here we see his obsessiveness in his attraction to number four. It is a very powerful, powerful force, this attraction. This is, of course, just a trivial illustration of attraction but tonight we uh, this this morning 
We want to study more of how we can be attracted to Jesus in order for Him to dwell supremely in our lives. If I were to ask the question right now, how would you rate your personal relationship with Jesus? If there, there is a scale of 1 to 10, where are you in this scale? How many of you feel that you are in the scale of 10 in your relationship with Jesus? Oh, nobody dares to say that yet. What about you are in the scale of 7? Okay, we have 1. 5. Of course, almost all of us will say 5. How about number 3? 2. We have one? One. You see, this is, this is of course different for each one of us because some of us will, will feel that our relationship with God is fair, is poor, is good. And none of us would even say that it is excellent. That is why we really need to know how we can be attracted to Jesus in order for us to live a life that will be focusing on Jesus to live in our hearts. Jesus should be our center of worship and He should be our, the center of our salvation, John 1, 14. The Word became flesh. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Because we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Last night, we studied about the cross. We studied about the man on the cross, the God-man on the cross, the two types of sinners, the one who died in sin, the one who died to sin. This morning, we're going to see how the man who died for sins the God-man, Jesus Christ, was incarnated. How important that incarnation was for humankind. What is actually the purpose of incarnation? Theologically speaking, of course, incarnation's purpose is to save mankind. It is said that the incarnation of Jesus is a sublime and unfathomable miracle. He was in the form of God, adored by the heavenly hosts, and seated upon the throne of the universe. But as the King of glory, He chose to give back the scepter into the Father's hands, that He might for a while be made lower than the angels in the likeness of men. And afterward, He would again receive all power, be enthroned amidst the adoration of angels and be crowned with glory and honor. It is sublime and unfathomable because in the minds of humans, this is something that is very rare. If we cannot find it, we can say that if we can even find such kind of instances, it is, it is very rare that someone who is in a high position would be willing to go down as low as death and then reclaim again that glory. Because for humans, once you are already in a position, it is very hard to let go of the position. In our SDA organizations, we can see things like such as this happening everywhere, whether it be in the church system, in the educational system, that sometimes when somebody is already holding power as a leader, it is very hard for him to go back to the grassroots again. But Jesus showed us an example that it was not so. Although he was seated on the throne of grace, he was willing to give back the scepter to God and come as a lowly human Theologically, it was to save men. Socially, 
Jesus incarnation was to mingle with men face to face. Why? Why did he need to mingle with men face to face? Because Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 says that sin has blocked the face to face communication between God and man. I wonder if we can actually experience face to face communication with God. And I, th I guess our lives here won't be that difficult anymore because we can immediately talk to God in a sense, physical, face-to-face -face communication. The Desire of Ages, page 24 says, Since Jesus came to dwell with us, we know that God is acquainted with our trials and sympathizes with our griefs. Every son and daughter of God of Adam may understand that our Creator is the friend of sinners. For in every doctrine of grace, every promise of joy, every deed of love, every divine attraction presented in the Savior's life on earth, we see God with us. He came here to mingle with man so that he can empathize, so that he can sympathize with our griefs. And if we look at the stories in the Old Testament, we see many instances where God has tried to, to come to, to have face-to-face -face communication with men. We see the story of Abraham in Genesis 18, verse 16. You remember when he was visited by three, three people, three visitors? In Genesis 18, verse 1, he said, The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre, where he was sitting at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. And so he invited them. He invited them so that he can, he can give them something to eat, that they may rest a while. But we remember when, when they left, when the two of them left, there was one who was, who, was, who was the last one to leave the tent. When the men got up to leave, they looked down toward Sodom and Abraham walked along with them to see on their way. In verse 17, it says, Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham from what I am about to do? It was actually God's theophany that he initiated the conversation with Abraham. Other characters that we find in the Bible is Jacob, who wrestled with an angel. We also find Moses, who had a conversation with God in a burning bush. We also see Joshua, who had a conversation with an angel as a man. We see Gideon, who sat down under, who, who, who had a conversation with a man under the oak tree. And then we saw Manoah, the father of Samson, who had conversation with an angel also. And so it is clear that in the instances of the Old Testament, it has always been God's desire to have communication with men face to face. And with the incarnation of Jesus, this all was accomplished when Jesus was present among humans, present among His creation, so that He can experience their grief, their sorrows, and everything that they are feeling. And most importantly, He can save them from all their sufferings. And so the question that comes up now is, how can men come to Christ if it is the desire of Jesus to have a face-to-face -face communication with us so that we can, we can let Him come and dwell supremely in our life? How can then we come to Christ? There are actually three methods. The first method is we can be drawn by the Father God. No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Jeremiah 17 verse 9, it is impossible because heart of man is wicked. And in the examples that we see in the Bible also, we see that Whenever, whenever God looks for us, we try to run away. Adam hid 
when he sinned. Abram lied to Pharaoh saying that Sarah was his sister because he was afraid. David committed sin cunningly when he got Bathsheba as his wife. The heart of the man is wicked. And so we cannot come to God on our own. We have to be drawn by the Father. The second method is that we can be drawn by Jesus himself. John 12 verse 32 said, And I, when I am lifted up from earth, will draw all people to myself. And in this idea of us being drawn by Jesus, we see, we see the following things that Jesus has made for us in order for us to be drawn by Him. The first thing that He did was, the Son of Man came to seek the lost. Christ came to seek the lost pearl which was buried beneath the darkness of ignorance and perverse iniquity of the earth. Manuscript releases volume 10, verse 20, 220, page 225. And the second thing, if we are drawn by Jesus, He died as the ransom of many, Mark 10, 45. A full and complete ransom has been paid by Jesus, by virtue of which sinner is pardoned and the justice of the law is maintained. All who believe that Christ is the atoning sacrifice may come and receive pardon for their sins. For through the merit of Christ, communication has been opened between God and man. God can accept me as His child and I can claim Him and rejoice in Him as my loving God. God's Amazing Grace, page 177. You see, Jesus illustrated the matter of being lost in three ways. The first illustration was the illustration, the parable of the lost son. You remember the prodigal son? The prodigal son knows that he, he went away from his house. And so throughout his journeys, he still knows the way back home. The prodigal son knows the way back home. But in the parable of the lost ship, the lost ship didn't know how to get back to his friends of 99 sheep. The shepherd had to go out and look for him and carry that sheep, bring him back to the fold. So in this parable of the lost ship, he doesn't know how to get the right track back home. And then the third parable on the matter of being lost is the lost coin. As the lost coin, the lost coin is not, is not a living thing. And so, when the lost coin, when that coin got lost, it became very dangerous because that lost coin didn't know how to get back home. He doesn't know how to get back home and he doesn't know even if he is lost or not. And so it is very dangerous for us if we are in this category of the lost coin. We may be attending church service every Sabbath. We may be excellent in our Bible classes. We may be excellent in our, in our other subjects. But when it comes to a relationship with Jesus, we are lost. We are just like the lost coin. Why? Because we are proud. We are proud. We want to show off what we have and what, what, what we are. We want to show it off. Because sometimes we are selfish. We don't want to help our friends in need. And then because sometimes we are always fault-seeking. When in fact, our faults might be bigger than, than the others around us. There is one characteristic of my people, the Manadonese people, the Indonesians who come from Manado. There is one characteristic of the Manado people which we call Baku Baku Chungkel. You know, if, if, you, have a, if you have a mango tree 
and then you want you want the you want to get the mango what do you what do you get you get a long bamboo pole and then you try to what is that in english or in tagalog you sungkil ah it's almost the same pala you sungkil that mango so it will fall so in our term we have the idea of baku baku chungkel we cannot see somebody else who is more than us and then we just want to chunkel so he will fall and we will go and somebody else behind us we chunkel and so it becomes a vicious cycle and that is why sometimes we are lost we are fault seeking we are always criticizing maybe we criticize our teacher oh ma'am but you ask us to do this this is too difficult blah 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 we criticize our brother we criticize our parents everything we will criticize we are envious it's almost like the theory of baku baku chungkel we are envy of any, anyone else who is higher than us who has more than what we have who is more talented than us we always want to be number one and that is why we are not humble we are not caring you know, this list can go very, very long if you want to out, outline all our shortcomings. But these reasons are the ones that make us sometimes lost like the lost coin. We do not know that we are lost. We do not know that we are lost. That is why the second method is we should be drawn by Jesus. And then we should also... In the third one, we should be drawn by the Holy Spirit. John 14 verses 15 to 17 tells us, If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father and He will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him or knows Him. But you know Him for He lives with you and will be in you. And so, my dear friends, the Holy Spirit is a helper in ever so many aspects. He comforts, and indeed, in his, that is the main theme of chapter 14, John chapter 14. Comfort is probable that Jesus has in mind to give comfort to us. The Spirit gives us comfort. And the Spirit has many functions. If we are drawn to Jesus, to, we are drawn to God by the Holy Spirit, it is through the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit teaches us, if we notice in John 14. It communicates to the saints. It edifies the church. It testifies of Christ. It imparts the love of God. It imparts hope. It teaches the saints. It dwells with and in the saints. And it abides forever with the saints and is known by saints. And so now we are switching from the idea of being lost as someone who is totally lost because of being drawn by the Holy Spirit. Then the Holy Spirit will dwell with the saints. Look at how important the drawing of this Holy Spirit is. And so this morning, we see that we are supposed to have Christ dwelling supremely in our lives. But maybe we didn't know how. But now we have seen that we can be drawn by God. We can be drawn by Jesus. And we can be drawn by the Holy Spirit. When we are drawn to Him, definitely He will dwell supremely in our lives. And in closing, I want us to remember these things. We actually do not have the power to come to God. No. We do not have the power. But because of His initiative to have a face-to-face -face communication with us, to have us get back to Him daily. Therefore, we can 
be drawn to Him so that He will live supremely in our lives. And for that reason, we have to always pray and confess our sins and shortcoming. And so just like what I have mentioned in the other days, let us continue the way we pray in our week of prayer. Let us use the method of acts in our prayer. Adoration, confession, and we can always have a time that we will share with Jesus every day so that we can finally be drawn to Him, not because of our, our effort, but because of God's willingness to bring us close to Him. The Holy Spirit is the agent of God to bring us back to Jesus, to the Father. We need to copy His life day by day. We are not the same, and we will never be the same like Christ. But it is not wrong if we try to copy the life of Christ in our lives. Because we need His character to be implanted in our lives daily. To be drawn to Jesus in every step of our lives. And Mrs. White says, Only when the character of Christ has been perfectly reproduced in His people, then He will come to claim them as His own. And so my dear friends, Jesus is waiting. He is waiting for us. He is waiting for us so that He can personally show His will for us in our life. Through His Holy Spirit, He is going to do that. And so, as we end, I want to ask, how many of us would like to have Jesus dwell supremely in our lives? Thank you. And how many of us are willing to spend time every day to cultivate a relationship with God through prayer? Thank you. And so, the final question will be, how many of us will be willing to live with the principles that we have studied throughout the week so that we can copy the pattern, we can follow Christ's examples in our lives in order for us to be drawn to Him. May I see your hands? Thank you. Please remember this. Please do not only remember it because of this Sabbath, but bring it this with us in our daily lives so that we can truly say that we are Christians. Our identity is in Christ because we are followers of Christ. May God bless you. Amen.